All right, James chapter 5. James chapter 5, if you, when you get there, if you'd stand. We're finishing up. We're going to be done here next week or so, maybe two more weeks, I think. Hebrews chapter 5, starting at verse 7. I'm just going to read from 7 to 11 for today's message. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and, uh, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of, ten, of tender mercy. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy, for sure. And I pray that you'll help us, Lord, from this lesson to learn how to be more patient. I pray you bless the sermon in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So in verse 7 there, this uh, text today starts off with, Be patient therefore, brethren. And, uh, of course, we've been talking a little bit about, um, oh, man, James has just been full, so full of, of different things. We talked about rich people here for a while, and some you know, would, would strive to be rich. They would try to gain riches, and that would be their main objective in this world. And, of course, uh, he says, hey, you know, you might as well just go howl and mourn right now because the end is not going to be good for you if that's what you're searching after. And so then he goes into this and says, be patient, therefore, brethren. Now, there's no doubt in the Bible that patience is something over and over we see God wants us to have. Uh, kind of expected of Christians. We should be people who are patient. And I think there's also no doubt that each of us can probably work on our patience a little bit more uh, if, uh, if, if, if we tell the truth about it. Okay, so over and over the Bible uh, talks about this. Uh, it's one of the attributes that we're supposed to be adding to our faith. Look at Second Peter. It's a great passage that we should be... Uh, you know, I, I, I come back to it often. I like this, uh, this challenge for us. You know, you're saved. You know you're saved. Praise the Lord for that. But now add to your faith uh, these things. It talks about 2 Peter 1. Add to your faith. Let me see here. It's uh, uh, verse 5. 2 Peter 1, 5. And beside this, give all, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience and the patience godliness and it goes on so we'd see there that that patience is something that we're supposed to be striving to add to our faith in other words that's our responsibility right diligence our salvation is not our responsibility god uh, gave that to us as a gift of god through jesus christ jesus christ paid that price and it's been a it's a free gift for us but now we add to our faith because that's how we accepted that free gift through faith now we add to that virtue and to virtue knowledge, and the knowledge temperance, and the temperance patience, okay? So Bible uh, tells us uh, that this is one of the things we should add to our faith. It also says that the long-suffering, doesn't use the word patience, but it says long-suffering is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22. And he just gets done listing a whole bunch of, of uh, fruits uh, of the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, all these. And verse 22 he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So, uh, similar to what we read in Second 
uh, Peter 1, but this is saying that it's a fruit of the Spirit, okay? In other words, you, you, you are going to have, you're going to have to, through diligence, work at doing this, but it's something you're going to have to rely on the Spirit for, okay? This is a fruit of the Spirit. You know, Jesus, remember, he said, without me, you can do nothing. We're going to have to be plugged into God uh, if we're going to be able to do these kinds of things. But it's going to require effort on our part. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. He's not just going to make us uh, people who are long-suffering and patient and loving and kind and all those things. We've got to work at it. So patience is definitely something that is a fruit of the Spirit. And we saw in James chapter 1, go back to James, look at the first chapter. James chapter 1, we saw in verse 4, it says, But let patience have her perfect work. Okay, so remember it said in, uh, in verse 2, it said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. You know, temptations there is not just talking about, you know, being tempted with a sin. Necessarily just saying being, you know, the trials, tests, temptations, tribulations, all those words are kind of interchangeable. Hard things that come in your life, it says, Count it joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Okay, so, uh, so the Bible says that it's part of the perfecting of the saints. It says, have her, uh, let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Okay, uh, you're not lacking anything because you are a mature Christian. That's going to come through patience. You're going to have to have some patience. All right, but back to our uh, text there, chapter 5. James chapter 5, I noticed that in my heading I wrote Hebrews. I don't know why, so if I say Hebrews, I probably mean James. James chapter 5, verse, uh, let's go back to verse 7 again. So he says, be patient therefore, brethren. Then, you know, he gives us kind of a, 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 a point to look off to. So how long should I be patient? You know, uh, this is a, this is something, okay, if I'm doing a, a race, for instance, I know, yeah, another running uh, illustration. I've got to be patient until the end, right? And sometimes it's hard to think of it like, man, I've got to just keep on going for how many miles? You know, I'll probably get burnt out and I'll probably want to quit. So I've got to look more like, well, let's just get to the next aid station or let's just get to the next light post, you know what I mean? Or let's just, you know, take five steps and then see if I'm still alive after that. <laughs> Whatever the case uh, you know, you have a certain, uh, you know, time that you're going to be enduring, the time that you're going to be suffering and uh, having patience. Here he says, unto the coming of the Lord. So we need to be, we need to, you know, work at having patience. And it's going to require in a Christian life that we continue to try to have patience. When's the race done? Well, it's not done until the Lord comes back. You know, you can't, you, you can't think that one day I'm going to get to a point in my Christian life or I'm going to be patient, and that's just I'm going to just reap all the benefits of all the years that I waited patiently and I endured trials and temptations. No, it's, it's going to keep going until the Lord comes back. In fact, the Bible shows us that depending on, uh, you know, if we're alive at the coming of the Lord, things are going to get really, really bad here at the end. So obviously not every safe person makes it to the end, so to speak, when the, the coming of the Lord. Uh, and so some are already at rest, some are, are asleep in Christ, the Bible says, uh, and, and they're waiting on that day. But until the resurrection, you know, they're, those who are still on earth, as a, as a whole, the church continues to endure. And uh, if you look at a couple places, we, we will come back to James, so don't lose your spot. But if we look at Matthew chapter 10... There's two verses here in Matthew that are very similar. Matthew chapter 10, and they both have to do with, in this setting, like this persecution that comes where Christians are being persecuted and tried. And We're not really living in that, that time too much right now, but we could see possibly where it could be coming. Uh, chapter 10, verse 22 says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Look at uh, chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Again, it's saying, uh, uh, 
many false prophets shall come, iniquity shall abound. And it says, verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, there's a false teaching out there. A lot of people will, uh, this will be their interpretation of what they say, the perseverance of the saints. And what they mean by that is that if you're saved, you will endure unto the end. And, and through that endurance, you know, that's kind of like part of your salvation almost is the way they teach it, because you will endure. Those who endure to the end, those will be saved. And that used to confuse me, and I used to say, well, that, that can't be what it means, because we know that our salvation is not based on our work. So maybe it just means that, you know, if you, uh, you know, those who do endure to the end will be saved. <laughs> I don't know. I remember trying to think about that as a kid. And then one day it dawned on me when I actually read it in its context. It's talking about going through these, these great time of tribulation that's going to come at the end before the rapture. And whenever that time comes, it's going to be trying times. There's going to be a lot of temptations. There's going to be persecution of the saints. And it says those that endure to the end of that are going to be saved out of that. It's not talking about, you know, that's a re reliance for your salvation. You're already saved, but you're going to be saved out of that physical temptation and trial, tribulation that's on earth. You'll be saved out of that. And the Bible makes that very clear, but the point is that the Christian life is going to be one of living and continuing in patience and enduring trial, enduring all these uh, tribulation stuff that comes our way unto the coming of the Lord. Uh, this is how we've got to expect that the Christian life is going to be. So then he gives, uh, you're back in James, then he gives the example here of the husbandman. And, you know, I, I, I guess a husbandman is kind of like a farmer, but uh, I don't know if farmer, it would be the exact right word, but you think about a husbandman being like a, a gardener is what I tend to think of. Uh, maybe it depends on how big it is, whether it's a farm or not, <laughs> but uh a gardener, somebody who, you know, is planting seeds, and it goes from that seed to dinner on your plate. That whole process takes a lot of patience. I know we live in a world where you go through the drive through and, you know, if two minutes go by and you still don't have your hamburger, you're just like, what in the world? <laughs> what is taking you so long, right? That's just a society that we live in. We want everything now, but, you know, really, you know, if, if, you know, one thing is you get what you, what you, however long you wait on something, it's probably going to have to do with how good it is, how much you're going to appreciate it at the end. Uh, but when it comes to farming and, and uh, or gardening or whatever the case, if you're actually planting that seed into the ground, you're going to have to wait till the right time to till the ground. If you don't till the ground, then you're probably going to have a hard time because some of the seeds won't take. Uh, you're going to have to till that ground, make it soft. You're going to have to uh, plant the seed, fertilize, you're going to have to wait. That's the hard part, right? You go out there every day, see if it's grown any. You know, there are some plants that grow pretty fast, uh, but some you're waiting, 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 and the seed's just not sprouted up. It's not, you know, nothing's coming up. And so you have to wait, and then you have to wait for the, the rain. You're hoping for water, you know what I mean? If it doesn't rain, you're going to have to figure out a way to, to water it yourself, and, and you, you got just this whole process of months uh, depending on the plant, you know, it might be months and months that you're waiting for the harvest. And if you're waiting on a tree, I mean, I think some trees like five to like 15 years before it produces fruit. That's a long time to wait. So like if you just plant an avocado tree, you know, and you think, hey, in a couple weeks, I'm going to get some avocados, you know, <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Uh, you're going to need a lot of patience. First of all, just to, have you, who's tried to plant, an who's tried to get an avocado to bear Man, that takes a long time just to get that thing to sprout. But anyway, that's your uh, little uh, botany lesson for the day. <laughs> so uh, uh, he uses the example there of the husbandman because, look, that's one thing in life that, uh, you know, in fact, that whole farm way of life, you tend, to, you tend to think of people who, you know, are slowed down and they're not in a hurry and their whole life is like, hey, knowing how to be patient. Not everybody, but... Uh, as a whole, it seems like the farm life is more like that. Verse 11, he says, uh, the end, he's talking about the end of the Lord. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen that the end of the Lord 
I have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of a tender mercy. So what is it that happened to Job at the end of the Lord? So Job had to endure all this trial, uh, all this hardship, and he was patient. You know, it wasn't easy. He obviously suffered, and he expressed how unhappy he was about the suffering. But still, he served the Lord. Still, he waited patiently. And the end is that the Lord blessed him. And the end is that he's honored to this day in the Bible. In fact, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, I can't remember if it's Ezekiel or, or Jeremiah where it, said, where it compares, uh, you know, like the best people in the world, world you know, and it's talking about uh, uh, you know, like Daniel and Job. And, man, I can't even remember. But there's like three people that are mentioned there, and Job's one of them, right? Because we, we think about this story, and he's been exalted in our minds and passed down through Scripture because of the fact that he endured uh, the tribulation. He continued to serve the Lord. And uh, we learned a great lesson from that. And in, in the end, he was. Now, now it's a story. It's a, it really happened. The story of Job is not fictitious, but it's a story. All the things in the Old Testament are that something that we can read now and we can learn from it. Okay. So now in the life of Job, it doesn't necessarily mean that, hey, if you just endure some affliction for a little while, it's going to go away. In the end, you're going to have just you know, a hundredfold what you had before, and you just endure it, and you just wait. God's going to just rain down blessings for you. No, all, all, what we wait for are blessings in heaven. We wait for our rewards in heaven. It's not to say that God won't bless us in this life, because he will and when we honor him and, and, and do what he tells us to do. But primarily what we can rest for sure in is the promise that we're going to reap those blessings in heaven and in, in eternity. Uh, but in the meantime, we as Christians continue to think of illustrations like the husband. And we think of people in the Bible like Job and people, you know, think about uh, uh, Joseph, you know, and how he had to just endure uh, persecution from his, from his brothers and he had to just wait on the Lord and the Lord blessed him mightily. Okay, and so we can think the same thing. Don't expect it necessarily in this life, but if you serve the Lord, he will bless you. Uh, if not in this life, definitely in the life to come. All right, so what I want to do is uh, I'm going to give you three points here from this text in James where we see that the end of the Lord is very good to people who, who will show their patience. And here are three different ways that we show our patience. Okay, so here are some things. Uh, that if we're going to be working on our patience, here's the things that we need to do. Okay, number one, verse eight. Be also patient. And then he says this, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Establish your hearts. That's the first thing. To establish, I know that's kind of an old word here in the King James. I'm sure modern translations change that. But it just means, you can kind of understand what it means just by hearing the word. It means to you know, of course, we think, think of establish, but it, it means to make firm or to secure, you know, or, or have something that's set, established. And so he's saying, establish your heart. And we realize that God can do things uh, in our hearts and in our lives. God can make us, you know, if, if God wanted to, he could give us patience. Right? But instead, there's this process where he allows trials to come so that our patience will, will grow. Okay, and so we know that God could establish our hearts and just make us ready to endure trial, tribulation, all those things. But the Bible doesn't say that he's going to do that. What the Bible says is establish your heart. Okay, notice that in verse, uh, more, verse I don't know what, verse 8. He says, uh, be also patient, establish your heart. It means it's, it's your responsibility. You can't just expect, oh, now that I'm saved, God's just going to, you know, establish my heart. No, he says you need to establish your heart. The first thing that we're going to need to do before we can ever dream of having a life where, we're, where we have patience and we can endure hardship and we know that God's going to bless us for all those kinds of things, the first thing we need to do is to establish our hearts. We need to decide in our minds. I'm not going to let, you know, I'm not going to let things rob me of the joy and happiness that I have in Christ. When something comes you know, obviously it's going to be a struggle. You're going to fall sometimes. You're not going to always have the patience that you wish you had. But you need to decide, look, I'm going to choose. When hardships come my way, I'm not just going to let it just, you know, knock me out. Uh, you know, I'm, I, knock me out of the fight and I don't want to serve the Lord anymore or something like that. You'd be surprised how many people, uh, you know, they want to serve the Lord. They're on fire for the Lord. Then a little tr 
trouble comes in their life, and next thing you know, that's it, I quit. You know, what, you think things are going to get easier because you stop serving the Lord and start serving yourself? It's not. You have to have patience, but you're going to have to decide first. To, you're going to establish your heart, and you're going, to, uh, you're going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to trade. Here's something we have to realize. Estab establish in your heart. I'm not going to trade a long-term investment for something that's going to bring me temporary gratification. If you're, going to have, if you're going to have patience in this life, you're going to have to have the mindset and have it in your heart that says, Lo, I'm, gonna, I'm in this for the long haul. This is a long-term investment. You know, I, I've not experienced a whole lot with invest, investment in my life. Uh, it's just I'm not, finances aren't my thing. <laughs> but uh, here's what I know that not long after I got married, we were in, uh, in fact, right when we got married, I was in, Bible college, and I was working at a place called uh, Lytton, no longer in ex existence. I don't, I mean, another company bought it out or whatever. Uh, but we made circuit boards. And it was a good company. They, uh, one of the things is, you know, in a way, probably the best company I worked for as far as the, the benefits and all that, good insurance. Uh, and they had uh, the first time I had ever learned what a, a 401k plan was, you know. And, and if you put money into the 401k, it's like an investment opportunity then they would match it, I think, to the dollar. However much you invest, they would invest that back. I would be a millionaire now had I continued <laughs> in the investments, I'm sure. But here's what happened. My wife's looking back like, what? <laughs> Maybe not a millionaire, but, you know, the way, that, the way that investments work is obviously the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the way that it grows, uh, uh, exponential growth means like the more that's going in on a regular basis you know and then it's like snowballing that now is a bigger investment and so uh, so it just keeps on growing exponentially and, it, and it's it's amazing how if you start early enough and I was pretty young you know that investment would really grow where's the investment now well I was in Bible college <laughs> times got rough and after I don't know five years or whatever it was uh, we were getting ready to make the move to uh, uh, to Oklahoma City, and I said, "Hey, you know, I've got so much saved up in my uh, 401k. I'll just pull that out, and we can live off that for a little while." Now, it was it ended up being good that that we had the money, but long-term investments doesn't mean five years. Long-term investment means you know you're talking about 30 years, 50 years, whatever. Like you're just letting that thing continue to grow, and in the end, you've got a nice, uh, you know, return on your investment when retirement comes or whatever, unless you just want to expect uh, Social Security is going to take care of you. By the <laughs> anyway, I won't go there. But uh, so you have to establish in your heart this idea. When it comes to serving God, we're not talking about finances now, but when it comes to serving God, you're going to have to say, I'm not going to just want to gratify my flesh and give up, you know, the rewards that I'm, sit, that, I'm, that I'm investing in heaven, I'm laying up treasures in heaven. I'm not going to give those things up for something that's going to gratify my flesh right now. And now I lost my rewards. You know what I mean? Now I, 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 uh, I don't have the blessings from God that I was going to have. Again, in this life or in the life to come. But even in this life, you think about it. You know, the first thing, you know, might come through my mind is somebody... Maybe a young Christian woman or a young Christian man says, hey, I'm going to keep myself pure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay a virgin till I get married. And then that moment of, you know, just this, the flesh, and all of a sudden they give in to that. What happens? Now they've messed themselves up. Like they had a great opportunity to be blessed by the Lord in a special way, uh, but they traded that investment for um, temporary gratification. Happens all the time. We all know that. A great example of this in the Bible, uh, there's several I can think of, but f the greatest example probably is Esau. I mean, Esau was hungry. <sighs> and you know how it is when you get hungry, uh, you, you kind of exaggerate things a little bit. Like, I'm going to die. You don't understand. Like, I can't take one more step. <laughs> you know, uh, they say you should never, you know, you should never go shopping whenever you're hungry because you'll, you'll just start buying everything in the store. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't like going shopping anyway, but I don't like going shopping when I'm hungry because it's just like, ugh, I gotta walk 
I don't have the energy uh, to walk anymore, right? Uh, but, you know, we got to, uh, where was I going with that? I got, I got distracted. Hold on, let me take a drink. I don't remember. Esau, okay, here we go. So Esau uh, was so hungry, he's out in the field hunting and all that. And out of nowhere, pops, in the, if you're reading the story, it's just all, all of a sudden, just like uh, J- Jacob's there. And Jacob's got this big pot of lentils, and he's staring. And Esau comes, and he's like, ah, give me some of those lentils to eat. And he's like, oh, you, are you hungry? I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. You know, give me your birthright. That was an important thing back in those days, their birthright. I mean, this was the inheritance. And uh, in, in, in many ways, it represented in the Old Testament our salvation. I'm not saying he lost his salvation by this, but I'm saying that this, this was supposed to be an important thing the blessings that God has promised to you, whatever. But um, Esau said, you know, I'm so hungry right now. Like, if I die, what's my birthright going to do me anyway? And so, like, I, I, you know, forget the birthright. You can have it. I just want some beans. And he ate the most expensive bowl of beans <laughs> he ever ate. And, uh, and then, you know, paid for it. For, from then on, he was sorrowful. He was so upset. His brother had tricked him out of his birthright and all this. And, of course, his brother ends up, uh, getting the ble- Jacob ends up getting the blessing, okay. All because you know Esau couldn't wait just a little bit longer, get back home. Uh, you know, I know that they didn't have fast food back then, but you know he could he could have got something to hold him over and uh, and survived another day. Okay, uh, so anyway, that's a great example. There's really not an excuse that a lot of people try to give. Well, it's just not me. I'm just not a patient person. Have you heard anybody like that? Like one thing about me is I'm just, I don't have very much patience. I hear it all the time and and really people use excuses, you know, all kinds of things. One thing about me, I I speak my mind. Or one thing about me, you know, there's so many things that people use that as an argument. Well, you got to understand me. It's like, yeah, that's called human nature. We all have tendencies to be sinful, (laughs) okay? But you need to establish in your heart, I'm not going to be like that. And so someone says, well, you just can't, I'm just not a patient person. Well, duh, because you're just giving into the flesh. Now, if you're going to be patient, the first thing you need to do is establish your heart. We need to work on it. The person's not just naturally patient. Ah, I guess there are some people, maybe there's a, a genetic tendency where they, they have a little more tendency to endure things more than other people, but it's your responsibility. God's not just going to give it to you. Uh, without your work towards. Okay, number two. <clears throat> so first uh, point here uh, from our text is that we need to establish our heart. Now let's go to verse 9. Uh, let me, I, you know what? Let me read 8 again just to get us uh, up to speed here. It says, okay, so it says, be, also, be ye also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now he gives us another uh, tip on patience. Grudge not, one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Now, what he's saying here, grudge not against another. Uh, we, we are familiar with this phrase, don't hold a grudge. Okay? Don't hold a grudge. Like you're bitter about somebody, uh, you, don't, you, you, you have resentment towards them for some reason or another, or maybe, and maybe it's something that because they did something to you and you're holding on to that, holding a grudge. Or maybe they didn't even do anything to you. You're just maybe jealous of them, or you just don't like them for some reason, and so you're grudging uh, towards them. The Bible makes it clear we're, we're not supposed to hold resentment, uh, and we're not supposed to have ill will towards other people. Of course, you know, if you're holding on to that, if it's just festering in you, you're just holding a grudge towards somebody, it's going to come out. It's, you're going to explode one day, and you're going to do harm to that person, either verbally or physically or something like that. And, but not just that. You're holding on to a grudge. If you're, if you're bitter, you have resentment towards somebody, you're going to destroy yourself. You know, you've heard it said a lot of times, like, you're the only one who you're hurting whenever you can't forgive somebody or you can't let a situation go. And, you know, somebody might be in that kind of situation and be like, no, it's not hurting. What are you talking about? You know, uh, how is it hurting me? Well, you know, here's the thing that I always think about in this kind of situation. When it comes to holding grudges or just being mad about somebody, I just don't know how they could just live with themselves knowing that they did me wrong. 
You know, well, here's the thing. They probably don't even remember doing you wrong. <laughs> they just moved on. They're living their life. And here you are holding on to this grudge. You got ulcers. You can't sleep at night. You got all this stuff. And they don't even know that you're mad at them. And so the Bible actually tells us that when we have a, a, a problem with somebody, when we, when we have a, somebody has done us wrong or whatever, look, it's our responsibility to either just let it go. Maybe you can. Some people can't. Maybe you can just let it go. Or maybe you say, if I let it go, it's going to get worse. So, you know, your other option is take care of it. But the option the Bible doesn't give you is just to sit around and hold a grudge for the rest of your life. Because <laughs> that's not going to help anybody. It's certainly not going to help you. You're not going to have joy. You're not going to have peace. And you're not going to be a patient person uh, because you just are holding on to a grudge. So uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And look at verse 15. Now this is particularly, Jesus is setting up, he's giving instruction how you're going to run in, uh, things in the church. It says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, Thou hast gained thy brother. Now, it would be wrong for you to say, you know what so-and-so did to me, and you haven't even gone to that person and told them that he offended you or that he did something wrong to you or she or whatever. And instead, you just go around telling everybody, you know what that person did to me, and I just can't believe it. And you're just holding on to this grudge and telling everybody and airing that out. You know, we all do it from time to time. Uh, but you're holding up all this, and that person doesn't even necessarily know that, he's done any, that, they've, that they've done anything wrong to you. And uh, he says, you know, instead of just going and blabbering and just telling everybody how much this person is offending you, go to that person privately. Before everybody else is in on this and before you've had time to be bitter and venge uh, uh, resentful, uh, go to that person privately and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. You say, ah, it won't work. I'll go talk to them. And they'll just get mad because I'm accusing them of this and that, and they won't listen to me, and it's just going to make things worse. Well, first of all, if God tells you to do it, it's not going to be worse in the end because his way is perfect, and so he, he's telling you the best option. But number two, it gives you a backup plan. Okay, so you go to this person. They don't listen to you. Things haven't got better. Maybe they even got worse. Well, here's what you do. You take another brother with you. If he would not hear thee, take with thee uh, one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word shall be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So at the end, you've gone to him, don't care. You've taken somebody else, don't care. Now, it brought it before the church, and the whole church is like, you know what, just, we're, just be done with that person. That person's just a wicked person. They won't, you know, even acknowledge that they've hurt you or whatever. And you know what? For the person who's been harmed, for the person who's been defrauded, that's a relieving fact now. I don't have to go around gossiping and telling everybody about this person's fault. Everybody just knows because it's, be, it's made a, a public matter because of the fact that he didn't deal with it. And now the, the, the people look bad at this person because he did you wrong. The other alternative is just you going around gossiping and people are just like, man, what is the deal with this person? They're so easily offended and and why don't they just go to that person and get it taken care of? Instead, they got this grudge. You see what I mean? So at the end of the day, just by following this and working on your patience and, uh, and staying humble and, uh, you know, all this, it's, it, you're going to be the one at the end who, it, who has the peace. You're going to be the one that he gets to sleep, you know what I mean, and, and is able to just let those things go and not worry you so much. And then the last thing is this maybe closely related, because it could be that the, the fault that you had with that person, it might have been a type of persecution, uh, but maybe not. But here in verse 10, I want to talk about the third point, which is endure persecution, okay? Uh, now, you've already established your heart. You already learned to not hold grudges or anything like that. Now, you're just going to endure persecution. This is the crux of having patience. This is what having patience is going to do. When somebody does you wrong and you haven't you didn't deserve that, uh, you know, that you're just, gonna, you're just going to uh, uh, stay firm and, and endure. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. 
1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. All right, so the title of the message was Patience and Happiness because uh, in, in our text there it said we, we count them happy which endure. Okay, literally in 1 Peter chapter 3, here's what he says, verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. When you humble yourself, and then somebody comes and does you wrong, you know, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be afraid of their terror. You suffered righteously. You didn't do anything wrong, but they're persecuting whatever. The Bible actually says be happy about it. Be happy about it. And Jesus, this matches the words of Jesus in Matthew 5. Let's go ahead and go there. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus uh, says something similar a few times, but we see here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice. Isn't that kind of like be happy? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now go back to uh, James again. What about the prophets? What does that have to do with anything? Well, look at verse 11 again. James chapter 5, verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very, uh, 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 pitiful, uh, is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now, actually, look at verse 10. Here's what I meant to show you. Take my brethren, the prophets. Right? Jesus said, yeah, so did the prophets before you. They suffered. Here's Jeremiah thrown into a pit for preaching the gospel. You know, uh, you could go down the list. I mean, Daniel, thrown into the lion's den. I mean, uh, all the prophets. The Bible talks about even Abel, who was killed by Cain, right? He calls him a prophet. Like, all the people that were prophesying and they were uh, showing forth the truths of God and speaking and being the mouthpiece of God, they were persecuted. And so at the end of the day, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, for doing right, preaching the gospel, uh, living righteously or whatever, and you're persecuted from that, it should actually bring you happiness. Now, it's easier to say than to do. I know that. Uh, but if you really stop and think and count the cost and realize what's going on here, it should bring you happiness. I want to uh, look at Acts chapter 5. That's the last place we'll turn. Acts chapter 5. There's one other verse. I'll just read it to you here in a minute. But look at Acts chapter 5. And look at verse 40. Acts 5, verse 40. Now, if you read the context here, you know, the disciples, are, they're preaching, and that every time they go preaching, it makes people mad, and they want to stone them to death or, or do whatever. And here they had sought to kill them, but then... Uh, uh, somebody r rises up, and he, you know, Gamaliel, he, he gets up, and, and, he, and he just basically, I think God just put it on his heart through the Spirit to, uh, to basically say, let's just let him go and leave it up to God, okay? But then, here's what it says in verse 39, let me see here, in verse 40, it says, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, right, so they didn't really just let them go, they still beat them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, how many think that the apostles stopped speaking in the name of Jesus after that? Of course not. They kept doing it, knowing we're going to get persecuted again. Every time we do, we're going to get persecuted. Not like they were trying to cause trouble. They're just trying to obey God. And while they're trying to obey God, others are like, no, we don't like this. And so they got to the point where they even beat them and threatened to throw them in jail and all this. And it says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Can you imagine? I mean, there were many times they were thrown in jail. 
beaten, uh, stoned. Paul was stoned to death and, and, and he somehow survived. Uh, but, I mean, I know that sounds funny, but <laughs> in the context, I think he literally died and came back from the dead. So he was stoned to death. And, uh, and uh, at the end of, of this, the apostles say, hey, we're counted worthy to suffer for Christ. That just sounds weird to just, if you're just in your normal mind just thinking, like, who in the world is going to say, oh, he counted me worthy. To, you would think it'd be like, oh, he counted me worthy to, to keep me out of persecution or to keep me away from harm and everything's going right in my, my life. He counted me worthy for that. No, he counts you worthy to give you persecution because just like, uh, just like Christ, you know, you ha are, are suffering persecution for the sake of the Lord. For the name of the Lord. Now, sometimes we think God is perfect. God is God. And so how could God even understand what we go through in this life? He doesn't know what it's like to suffer, you might think. He doesn't understand that. I mean, I mean, he doesn't know temptation. He's, he, would never, uh, he would never sin. He would never, you know, there's nothing he would, he's not able to endure. I mean, you're thinking about the characteristics of God, and you're like, there's no way that he can relate to or understand our suffering and, uh, and, and what we have to endure. But the fact is, the Bible says he has endured it. He has endured suffering. Now, you know, I, I realize that God doesn't exist in, in, in a particular time and space, and so the Bible says that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the earth, so it's like uh, from the foundation of the world, and so it's like God has always known what Jesus was going to go through. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but it's like it was already done before he actually did it because God doesn't dwell in time. And here's what the Bible says. In Hebrews 4, 15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched uh, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So God himself. You understand God's Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. God himself has experienced pain, infirmities, suffering. He took on human flesh. The Word of God became flesh. And, uh, and he, he was uh, in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The only difference is we give in to sin. We give in to temptation. He did never give in. So... Because he knows what it feels like, I think this is why God is so merciful to us. You know, it's not like he just, uh, you know, there are times where you feel like, man, God must be scratching his head. Like, how are these people so dumb? How are these people not getting it? And sometimes the Bible seems to indicate like he's feeling that way. But at the end of the day, it, gives, it keeps coming back to him saying, you know, he's, he's slow to wrath. He's pitiful. He's full of mercy. Not pitiful, you know what I mean by pitiful, like he show, he has pity, uh, you know, and, and over and over. In fact, the Bible says he's, he's, he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, okay? So he's, he's waiting, he's enduring, he's waiting for everybody to hear the gospel and have an, a, an opportunity to get saved. You know, if we really got what we deserved and we just got eternal torment in hell, uh, you know, that would seem like an unmerciful God. And there are some people that are going to get that. I'll talk about that in tonight's message uh, about reaping, reaping and sowing. But God has been so merciful that he provided us a way out through Jesus Christ. And he's, he's, just, he's waiting for those, however, who love him and those who have uh, shown patience and learned patience. He's waiting to pour out his blessings and rewards upon them for doing so. So if we're going to ever be people of patience and, ha and, and experience the end of the Lord like Job did and see what's going to happen, how God's going to bless way above and beyond what you can ever imagine for the little bit that you give up on this earth. You know, the Bible talks about uh, being rewarded a hundredfold for, the th for each of the things that you give up in this life uh, for him. Just for that little bit of, uh, of endurance, here's what we need to do. Number one, we need to purpose in our hearts, okay? Establish our hearts that we're going to be patient. Number two, we need to learn not to hold grudges. That's going to help us go a long way towards having patience. And number three, learn to endure persecution. These are the, the elements here of the type of patience that God's looking for, the, God, the type of patience he wants us to have.
and, uh, and we can all do it. It's up to us. It's our decision uh, to do. I mean, it's our decision to make and say that we're going to be people of, pa uh, of patience. God, establish your heart to do so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you uh, have borne our uh, penalties of our sins on the cross. Thank you that you have descended and ascended and uh, you've conquered death, you've conquered pain, and, and uh, you've conquered sin, Lord. And so I pray that you will help us uh, to rely on your strength and rely on you as we get through this life and we endure uh, trials and hardships, uh, primarily those that would come from us living righteously and maybe being uh, persecuted as a result of that. Whatever we go through in this life, Lord, I pray you just help us to look look towards you and, and keep our heads up and, and keep focused on our eternal rewards and, and uh, that we would not uh, waste that investment. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll bless each, each and everyone here. Uh, give us the strength to be able to do that and the knowledge and understanding of your word. Uh, bless the afternoon as we travel. Keep us safe as we go home and, and uh, as we go to Kansas City. Those of us that are going there, keep us safe, Lord. Bring us back. We pray you be glorified in all that's done today in Jesus' name. Amen.